So, in the, in the last lecture, we had introduced uh, these inequalities, Markov inequality and Chebyshev's inequality, but I feel that uh, revisiting them is necessary, because uh, some aspects need to be emphasized. And in fact, um, uh, the Markov inequality has its strength in its simplicity and its generality, because you see um, the inequality is very simple to state, but um, this can be very uh, useful and powerful at places, and uh, also the strength lies in its generality, because it is just that you need to know that there is a random variable whose uh, expected value exists, and that is it, and then you can uh, you know state facts about uh, certain probabilities. Okay. So, let us see uh, interesting applications of uh, the Markov inequality. Consider a group of 500 people. Now, the kind of you want to ask this question, is it possible that at least 90 percent are younger than the average of the group? The ne next question is, is it possible that at least 50 percent are older than twice the average age? And another question could be, is it possible that uh, more than one third are older than three times the average? So, let us try to see uh, what kind of answers uh, Markov inequality will give you. So, for the first part of course, uh, the answer is yes and I will explain why, but if you look at the uh, if you try to get the bound from the Markov inequality, you see um, the inequality says that for x greater than or equal to e x the probability that x is greater than or equal to e x will be less than or equal to e x upon e x because you take E x of this and then divide by this, which is equal to 1. So, that is uh, no bound, because you know that all probabilities are less than or equal to 1. And the converse of this event would be probability x less than E x, which would then be greater than or equal to 1 minus 1 converse of this, because this is less than or equal to 1. So, this will become 1 minus 1, which is 0. So, again um, this does not give you any information. So, uh, that is what we are trying to say. We are saying that um, possible that at least 90 percent are younger than. So, younger than means that you want to compute the probability of the event that x is less than E x, right, younger. This is what you want to compute. So, um, um, uh, so I should have said here, this is comma. Uh, less, uh, so, therefore, uh, this uh, the Markov inequality just tells us that this is greater than or equal to 0. So, that is no help, but of course, uh, you can uh, rationalize uh, the f, uh, this thing that the answer would be yes, because there may be some people who are very old and therefore, um, they will twil, uh, they will uh, make the average go up to. So, so, even if 90 percent are younger, that means what we are saying is that the answer to this is yes, because uh, 90 percent are younger, uh, even then uh, the uh, few people who are very, very old will till will uh, lift the average. And so, uh, this inequality would be uh, you know this the probability of uh, 90 percent are younger would be satisfied. That means, probability x less than E x is uh, equal to 90.9 would be uh, satisfied. So, to answer the second question, what we want is that older than uh, twice the average age. That means, you want the probability x greater than twice E x and you want a bound that this is um, at least uh, at least uh, 50 percent people are older than twice the average age. So, if I want this probability, then this is less than or equal to probability x greater than or equal to twice E x, right, because this event is bigger than this event and this by Markov's inequality would be less than or equal to E x upon twice E x. Okay. So, we divide by this and so, um, this but that is equal to 0 0.5. So, therefore, the answer would be yes, because uh, probability that x greater than 2 e x equal to 0 0.5 is a possibility. Yes, but uh, probability x greater than 2 e x greater than 0 0.5 is not a possibility. So, but since this is possible, we will say that the answer is yes, that um, at least 50 percent will be older than uh, twice the average age. So, interesting uh, applications you see. Then to answer the third uh, part, that is probability x greater than 3 times E x okay, um, and you want a bound on this. So, uh, this is less than or equal to probability x greater than or equal to 3 times E x, same argument as uh, uh, earlier and this by Markov's inequality is less than or equal to 1 by 3. So, here you want that the uh, at least 1, 3 are greater than the probability that at least uh, 
uh, one third are greater than thrice the uh, average age. So, the answer is no, because this is less than or equal to 1 by 3. So, this cannot be more than. So, this event, the probability of this event cannot exceed 1 by 3. So, um, uh, the answer here is no. Now, similarly, let us look at the, the Chebyshev's inequality, which says that um, probability absolute value of x minus mu greater than or equal to c times sigma is less than or equal to sigma square upon u uh, divided by the square of this, which is c square sigma square. So, this is equal to uh, 1 by c square, 1 by c square. Okay. Uh, and so, if you consider the event that probability of um, absolute value of x minus mu greater than or equal to twice sigma, then this will be less than or equal to 1 by 4, which is 0 0.25. So, now if you look uh, compare this with the some of the actual probabilities, then you see uh, for uh, x being uh, distributed as normal uh, mu with mean mu and variance sigma square, and you are looking at the probability that. Uh, absolute value of x minus mu is greater than or equal to twice sigma, then uh, the actual probability is 0 0.456. So, therefore, um, you can see that this is much, much smaller than uh, 0.25. And if you um, uh, look at the uh, diagram, so therefore, if this is the mean, uh, your x axis is this and then this is your uh, p d f uh, the uh, axis for this p d f. Then you see here, um, uh, you take the um, area that means, what you are saying is that this area, this area between a line between, because absolute value x minus mu greater than or equal to 2 sigma means that x lies between uh, mu minus 2 sigma and mu plus 2 sigma. So, these are the limits and so here what we are saying is that this area would be uh, uh, 1 minus 0.0456. This is the area, which we are depicting here. And so, uh, the uh, uh, difference is quite large. And this becomes even more uh, uh, significant or more glaring, the difference between the Chebyshev bound and the actual uh, bound or the actual probability. If you take probability, if you take the probability of x minus mu greater than or equal to 3 sigma, then this will be less than or equal to 1 by 9, which is 0.111. Uh, by the uh, Chebyshev's inequality, but the actual probability is actually very small. It is 0 0.0013, which is see what here again uh, because of the symmetry. See remember, so here this will be mu minus three sigma, and this is mu plus three sigma. So uh, you are asking for yeah exactly. So that area I am showing uh, that means between uh, mu minus three sigma and mu plus three sigma. So this whole area I am saying is 0.9987. Okay. And uh, that is because we know that uh, by symmetry, uh, this area, the tail, this part, tail part and these two are the same. Okay. And so, we have discussed this uh, many times before also. So, therefore, so that means actually the uh, tail, the, that means this tail area is, point, is half of this 0 0.0065 and here also the tail is 0 0.0065. And so, therefore, um, yeah. So, uh, the difference becomes uh, you know bigger and bigger and uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, you know one can go on and looking at these interesting parts that the these inequalities, but uh, at times they provide you uh, very they are very useful tools and they uh, as I told you for the Markov Markov inequality, it can answer some very interesting questions and here also we will see various applications of the Chebyshev's inequality. A Markov inequality is not able to say much, but you can see the thing is that uh, the answer would be yes, because uh, you can always have a uh, uh, small number of people who are very, very aged, whose ages are very big and therefore, uh, uh, the average. So, therefore, the 90 percent can still be younger than the average age, because these uh, older people, they pull up the average. Okay. So, therefore, the answer is yes. Now, if you look at the second question then you are asking for the probability that x is greater than or equal to twice E x. So, twice the uh, average age okay. and therefore, uh, by uh, Markov inequality, this would be E x upon 2 E x, which is 1 by 2, which is 0.5. So, Markov's inequality gives you the bound that this probability cannot exceed 0.5 and so therefore, the answer here will be no. right? So, the answer is no 
because here they are asking is it possible that at least 50 percent are older than twice the average age. So, no uh, 50 percent will not be older. So, this is uh, this probability would be always less than or equal to 0 0.5. And similarly, for the third question probability x greater than or equal to 3 times e x that will be less than or equal to e x upon 3 e x and this is 1 by 3. So, therefore, again more than 1 by 3 is not possible. Right, more than 1 by 3 are greater than 3 times, because this probability the bound upper bound is 1 by 3 and therefore, again the answer is no. So, uh, I just thought that uh, this gives you another insight into the uh, Markov inequality and its uses and one can go and discover more and more about the usage of this particular inequality. Now, similarly for Chebyshev's inequality, I wanted to just point out that if you uh, ask for the probability that mod of x minus mu is. So, therefore, you have a random variable x, which has a expected value as mu and uh, variance x is sigma square. So, just a random variable with mean mu and variance x is uh, sigma square. You are asking the question mod of x minus mu or absolute of x minus mu is greater than c sigma. So, by Chebyshev's inequality, this would be sigma square upon c square sigma square, this is 1 by c square. right? So, in particular if you put uh, if you put c equal to 2, then this is the probability that mod of x minus mu is greater than 2 sigma and therefore, this will be less than or equal to 1 by 4, which is 0.25. So, in other words you see here, uh, if you uh, if I have drawn the normal curve does not matter. So, therefore, this is minus 2 mu and this will be 2 mu. So, in this we are asking for the area uh, that means, the probability that this is greater than 2 sigma. That means, the area on to the left of minus 2 mu and the area to the right of 2 mu. So, that will give you the probability that mod of x minus mu is greater than 2 sigma and this is less than 1 by 4 in for in general for universally true, this is universally true which is 0.25. Now, if you compare this with the for the uh, for normal n mu sigma that means, if your random variable x is mu sigma, then uh, this probability is 0 0.0456. So, therefore, compared to this, this is really a loose bound, loose upper bound, but later on we will see how um, uh, no matter because of its universality. Uh, the Chebyshev's inequality. This is very useful in proving many other results uh, in the pro in probability theory. Right. So, so anyway, I just thought I'll uh, give you an estimate. So that because uh, the normal uh, curve is symmetric about mu, and then it is bell shaped, so uh, the mass is concentrated around mu for normal, and therefore this probability would be small because the area lying on the left of minus two mu and to the right of two mu will be much smaller than uh, compared to the area which is around mu. So, therefore, this this and similarly if you uh, take c to be 3, then the uh, difference is more marked, because uh, probability mod x minus mu greater than these 3 sigma is less than or equal to 1 by 9, which is 0 0.11. Anyway, for, for so that means, what it says is that for most of the distributions, the area uh, uh, the, the mass of under the curve lies. Um, the probability mass uh, lies within minus 3 sigma, this is minus 3 sigma and 3 sigma, then the area inside here is 0 0.9987. So, only this much area lies outside, which means half of this. Okay, I will have to be very sure that, yeah, if this is this, then the half of this, the half that means, this if you further do it 0 0.0006. So, this is the area which lies here and the both. Uh, this, this area is 0 0.006 and that is 0 0.006. So, this is the idea. I mean, so, therefore, uh, uh, Chebyshev's inequality is an upper bound, but because uh, it is applicable to all the distributions, uh, therefore, um, it has its own uh, uh, uses and applications. Okay. Now, the third inequality that we want to talk about is Jensen's inequality and this inequality relates expectations instead of probabilities. Okay. So, like for example, both these these inequalities uh, were uh, giving you uh, upper bounds for the probabilities of certain events, but uh, Jensen's inequality relates um, uh, the uh, expectations. Right. But before that, before I give you the Jensen's inequality, we I need to define convex and concave functions. So, um, 
and some of you may have already come across for example, uh, convex lenses, concave lenses you may have heard of. Uh, so, here the a function is said to be uh, convex, uh, if, it, if it is twice differentiable, if a function is twice differentiable real valued function, then it is said to be convex, if its second derivative is non negative in the domain of f. So, wherever f is defined, then uh, at all those points, if your f double prime x is non negative, then the function is said to be convex. And if um, the double derivative is less than or equal to 0, then the function is said to be concave. So, therefore, the relationship between convex and concave is that if f is convex, then it will imply that minus of f x is con concave. So, now here for example, I have drawn for you a convex function twice differentiable. And um, what we are saying is that see if, if uh, uh, f double prime x is greater than or equal to 0, then f prime that this implies that f prime x is non decreasing, right. If the uh, wherever you take a function f and if its derivative is uh, non negative, then we say the function is non decreasing. Here f double prime x is non decreasing. So, this implies that f x is uh, sorry f double prime x is greater than or equal to 0, that implies that f prime x is non decreasing. So, you see here for example, these are the tangents to the curve right and see these angles they are negative, they are obtuse and your um, if you all of you remember your uh, the um, graph of tan x, because slope is given by uh, f prime x is the slope tan of the angle tan of this angle right, the, tan, the, tan of the tangent of the angle that the tangent at the curve makes. So, your for example, uh, this is uh, if this if you take this as this is 0, this is pi by 2, then this is pi and therefore, um, on this side of this it is like this right. So, the function is obtuse angle and the curve is increasing right. So, as the angle becomes and then of course, this becomes the uh, the angle becomes up to pi and so, tan of pi is 0. So, your derivatives uh, the tan of these angles are increasing and then finally, at this point at the this point it becomes 0 and then when you take this then you can see that the angles are increasing right. So, therefore, for obtuse angles again tan is increasing. So, this is the idea. So, therefore, uh, the first derivative is non decreasing. Also, that the tangent at any point of the curve lies below the curve, right, because you see, see the function is like this. So, the tangent is this. So, tangent is always below the curve, right. And so, here uh, when you uh, say that minus f x, minus f x means you will turn it upside down. Right, you over. So, therefore, a convex function you can say uh, uh, holds water, a concave function will not hold water, because it will be upside down. So, this thing will be up and a function will be like this. So, this will be a concave function. right? Now, of course, here I have said um, uh, about given you the definition of a twice differentiable, but for example, if you take y equal to mod x, this is also convex. Okay. But of course, this is not differentiable. So, none of these things uh, you know it is differentiable at these points, uh, but at not at the origin. So, this holds because it is constant. See here the slope is minus 1, here the slope is 1. So, in any case the uh, slope is increasing, because this is this here it is not defined, but this. So, uh, this is also a convex function and of course, there are many many ways of to of characterizing a convex function. So, now I will state the uh, Jensen's inequality for convex and concave functions. So, um, the Johnson, Jensen's inequality says that if f x is a real valued convex function, then uh, expectation of f x so this should be capital X, because uh, function uh, f is a function of the random variable x, then E uh, expectation of f of x is greater than or equal to f of E of x. Okay. So, that means, you exchange f and E, then the inequality is this kind. So, for x a random variable with uh, E x equal to mu finite. So, the um, requirement is that the um, um, mean the uh, expected value must exist, 
or a random variable and if uh, a function f is convex, then uh, this would be e f x is greater than or equal to f of e x. Now, you can see that if you replace this by, if you multiply the uh, inequality by minus sign, then the minus sign will go inside and it will say that expectation of minus f of x right, is less than or equal to uh, minus f of e x. Right. And since, <coughs> so minus as we said earlier, when we are defining a convex function that minus f will be concave, if f is convex. So, therefore, for the concave function, the inequality reverses. Okay. So, this is your uh, Jensen's inequality. So, it is just relating your uh, uh, expected values. Right. And you can, uh, in, if the function is convex, then the inequality would be greater kind and for concave, it will be less kind. Uh, now, we already know that uh, expectation of for example, x square if the second moments exist, expectation x square is greater than or equal to expectation of x whole square. That means, my function f x here is x square and this we know is convex, right? It's, uh, everybody knows it is a parabola or the second derivative is 2, a constant which is non-negative. So, this is a uh, convex function, but we already know that uh, variance x can be written as expectation x square minus expectation x whole square and this is always non-negative. So, from here also it follows that expectation x square would be greater than or equal to uh, square of expected x. Right? Okay. Consider the function f x equal to 1 by x then if you just find out the first derivative, this is minus 1 by x square and second derivative would be uh, see x raised to minus 2. So, minus 2 uh, and plus um, and minus sign plus 2 upon x cube and this is always non negative for x positive and therefore, um, uh, this is a convex function. And so, by Jensen's inequality um, expected value of 1 by x is greater than or equal to 1 upon expected x. Right? And uh, quite a few people often mistake this and they say that expectation of this will be right. So, now you know better because the Jensen's inequality says that this will be greater than or equal to. They are not the same thing expectation of 1 by x and 1 by expectation x are not equal. So, this also you can now uh, uh, assert by uh, using Jensen's inequality uh, and you can consider the function log x. Uh, log x, the second derivative is minus 1 by x square. First derivative would be 1 by x. So, when you take the second derivative, it will be minus 1 by x square and this is less than 0 for x greater than 0. Anyway, the function this is defined for x positive and so, uh, by Jensen's inequality, expectation of log of x is less than or equal to log of expectation of x, because for convex concave function, the inequality reverses. Okay. Proof is simple. So, I will use the uh, first property that uh, the uh, uh, tangent at any point of a convex function lies below the curve. Right? So, the curve always goes uh, is above the thing and of course, they meet at this point. So, the tangent is at the point mu, then the value here the coordinates are mu g mu and so, if I take uh, a plus b x as the uh, tangent to g x at the point x equal to mu, right? then uh, uh, g x convex implies that uh, g x is always greater than or equal to a plus b x and g mu will be equal to a plus b mu, because the curve and the tangent line they meet at this point. Okay. And so, therefore, um, since uh, this holds, so therefore, when I replace x by a random variable, uh, the inequality remains uh, intact. So, g of uh, random variable x is greater than or equal to a plus b of x. And so, uh, uh, therefore, the expectation will also uh, they will not change the inequality. So, when I apply expectation on either side, it will be e of g of x is greater than or equal to a plus b e of x, right. a and b are constants. So, this is what the, the proof uh, and so a plus b of e x is a plus b u, which is g of u, g of mu, sorry, a plus b mu, which is g of mu and mu is your expected value. So, therefore, this is g of e of x. So, therefore, here uh, from here you have shown this inequality. Okay. So, simple proof by using the convexity of the function right? and then uh, the fact that uh, when you have inequality. So, this is a bigger function than this 
So, I hope you can all agree that, because even if, if you are taking x to be a continuous random variable, then if your uh, this thing is, uh, if your um, density function of course, is non-negative. So, here you are taking the difference. So, if you take the difference of uh, g x minus a minus b x, which is a non-negative function. So, then integral whatever the limits would be also non-negative, and so uh, this will be satisfied. Right? So, therefore, from here to here is uh, no problem. Okay, uh, and therefore uh, you can prove the Jensen's inequality. Yeah, and uh, yeah. So therefore, uh, the figure is also quite uh, explanatory. Now, uh, an alternate proof, because uh, since we can, I will, you, we have uh, the definition of convexity. So I'll use the twice differentiability of the function now. So, since f is uh, convex, so it is twice differentiable in its domain and uh, Taylor's expansion of uh, f x at x equal to mu up to second order terms yields. So, now those of you who are uh, feel comfortable with uh, uh, calculus, then you know about the Taylor's expansion that every function can be expanded in the neighborhood of a point. Uh, where in the neighborhood it has all these derivatives. And so, here since I have assumed that it is second order derivative uh, exists. So, therefore, I can write f x as f mu plus x minus mu into f prime x plus x minus mu whole square by 2 factorial into f double prime psi, where psi belongs to mu comma x. So, such a psi exists. Okay and uh, in the interval. So, it can, whether it is mu comma x or x comma mu does not matter, because you are taking the square here. So, there is a psi in, in this interval and therefore, this would be the uh, exact expansion. That is what Taylor says. So, Taylor's theorem says that such a psi always exists. Okay. Now, since f double prime uh, psi is non-negative, because f double prime is non-negative in the whole domain. So, uh, this non-negative and this is a square square of a real number. So, this quantity is non-negative. Therefore, I can say that f x is greater than or equal to f mu plus x minus mu into f prime x. So, which you know you if you write this in terms of. So, f of x is greater than or equal to f mu. I should have written this step x minus mu f prime x f prime x. Right just that as we did here in this first proof. And now, you can take the expectation. So, expectation f x again the same reasoning the inequality will not get reversed. So, this will be f mu plus now uh, expectation of x minus mu is 0. So, you are left with only f mu here and f mu is f of e x. So, therefore, again uh, the Jensen's inequality has been proved. Okay. So, I just wanted to uh, point out this correction uh, in the Jensen's inequality proof. See, I was giving you an alternate proof and uh, there I uh, had to expand the function f x uh, by Taylor's expansion uh, at the point mu. And the correct expansion is that f x is equal to f mu plus x minus mu f prime mu plus half x minus mu whole square f double prime psi. Now, uh, instead of mu, it got written as uh, x. So, therefore, you have to read f prime mu instead of f prime x. And then of course, we know that psi is a number, which is uh, some number between mu and x. And by Taylor's theorem, the such a psi always exists. So, we are taking a two uh, second order expansion of the function f x at mu. And so, this should read as f prime mu instead of f prime x. So, um, and as we go along, we might also see uh, some more occasions to use, the, uh, use this inequality. But I think this gives you a good feeling about the Jensen's inequality. So, an interesting example of the Jensen's inequality is that you know an investor is faced with two choices. She can either invest all her money in a risky proposition that will lead to a random return x that has mean m, or she can put the money into a risk free venture that will lead to a return of m with probability 1. Right. So, these are the two choices she has and suppose she bases her decision on maximizing an expected value of u r, where r is a return and u is her utility function. 
So, by some uh, advice, somebody's advice or something, she has uh, now decided that she will uh, uh, base her decision to invest whether in the risk free venture or the risky venture uh, by maximizing the expected value of u r. So, where r is uh, the return function and u is the utility uh, function. So, u of r. Now, by Jensen's inequality, it follows that if u is concave, then expected u x will be less than or equal to u of e x, which will be u of m. Right? So, the risk free venture is better. Right. So, here uh, the expected return of u x will always be less than or equal to u of e x, which is u of m. Right. So, therefore, it is better to uh, invest in the risk free venture. Now, if u is concave, then this implies that uh, your uh, e of u x will be greater than or equal to u of m. So, the risky venture is profitable, because the expected return here would be greater than or equal to u of m. Right. So, this is u is her utility function and in the risk free venture, she gets uh, exactly uh, m return. So, therefore, um, this will be the total uh, I mean the, the utility to her of the return that she gets from the risk free venture. And so, um, and this is expect because x is a random return. So, e of um, expected value of u x. So, that will always be greater than or equal to u m in case the function the utility function is convex. So, therefore, the risky venture is profitable. So, and there can be many more interesting examples of uh, these uh, inequalities that we have just studied. So, the next thing that we want to talk about, which again has a very important role to play and these are the uh, limit theorems. And so, let us just first uh, try to understand the concept of uh, what we mean by these uh, limit theorems. So, the first uh, definition that I want to make is uh, the definition of uh, you know uh, a sequence of random variables converging in probability to another random variable. Right. So, here um, this is that x 1, x 2, x n is a sequence of jointly distributed random variables for n greater than or equal to 1. That means, you must have at least uh, more than 1 defined on the same sample space omega and let x be another random variable defined on omega. Right. Then we say that x n converges to x in probability. That is, so the notation is that x n goes to x in probability, if for every epsilon greater than 0, limit of this absolute value x n minus x is greater than epsilon. So, this limit converges to 0. So, in other words, in probability uh, the sequence the random variable x n is converging to x and please understand. So, here this is different from your concept of usual limit. Uh, where the p is missing. right? So, in that case, then you say that in value x n the sequence is converging to x. That means, uh, when as n becomes larger and larger, the distance between x n and x will be very small, right? because epsilon is an arbitrary number greater than 0. So, I can go on making epsilon small and small. So, but here the limit is in terms of probability. Probability of this event, that means of this difference x n minus x greater than epsilon becomes an impossible event, right? because the probability is 0. So, this is the idea of uh, convergence in probability. Right? Then the other definition that uh, I want to make is that of um, Okay, and this this is called uh, this uh, convergence in probability. I've already given one name. It's also called stochastic convergence, convergence in measure. Measure is your probability here, or weak convergence. Okay, so this is one definition, and the other is uh, the convergence in distribution. So we will say that x n converges to x in distribution or in law if the limit of f x n t, that means the um, cumulative distribution function of x n. So, at the point t converges to the distribution cumulative distribution function of x at for at t as n goes to infinity and this must happen at each point t where f x is continuous. Okay. So, that means and in fact obviously, uh, this is also continuous uh, at that point. So, limit f x n t the cumulative distribution function of the random variable x n, this converges to the cumulative distribution function of f x t um, of x as n goes to infinity. Right. So, um, now in uh, you know uh, abbreviating the uh, notation. So, this says that f n goes to f, where f n t is the um, uh, 
cumulative density function distribution function of x n and f we denote by the cumulative distribution function of x. So, at t. So, notation for x n converges to x in distribution we also say that x n going to x in distribution. So, the notation that I have written down or the uh, cumulative distribution function f n of x n which is f n, f n going to f the cumulative distribution function of x in distribution and uh, d can also be replaced by l. So, both these notations are valid. So, this is also called weak convergence, weak convergence in uh, law or weak convergence in distribution. So, you can see the difference, because here it is only we are saying that probability of this event is becoming 0 as n goes to infinity just uh, the, the whereas, here the whole distribution the cumulative distribution function the whole of the function is converging to the cumulative distribution function of x at every point t where uh, it is defined where it is continuous. Okay. Now, convergence in probability and convergence in law are very important and we will see as we go along that uh, the numerous applications uh, of these uh, 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 these convergences and are easier to prove and then the less important types of convergence called strong convergence. So, maybe in this course we will have a chance to look at one or two a strong type of convergence is also, but uh, the uh, more, more widely used uh, are the uh, weak convergences and these are law and probability. So, we will uh, now uh, define um, uh, uh, law of la weak law of large numbers. Law of large numbers states that if you have a sequence of these random variables identically independently distributed random variables. Uh, such that uh, the expected value of each of them is mu and variance uh, is sigma square and these are finite quantities that means the variance exist then uh, you define x n bar so x n bar would be the average of the values up to n so sigma x i uh, i varying from 1 to n divided by n and then uh, in simple terms the weak law of large number says that uh, this sequence of averages x n bar right. So, as the n goes to infinity that means, when you take n plus 1 it will be uh, average of x 1 x 2 of x n plus x n plus 1. So, uh, then so this this is the sequence that you are generating by taking uh, averages of n n plus 1 n plus 2 and so on. And then uh, so, this sequence converges to the mean of the or the expected value of the random variables. Now, the idea here is that um, so, actually this gives and this this will happen in probability right. I mean, so the whole idea because we say that weak law of large numbers. So, the whole convergence the concept is in terms of probability and so what we are saying is that uh, uh, since the uh, uh, it is converging in probability the probability high that uh, I th that means, I can take the for large enough n I can take x n bar as a good estimate of mu. Otherwise, how do we how do we have uh, because we we just have these sample values which we have taken uh, uh, randomly and then uh, we are wanting to estimate the uh, uh, mean of the distribution. So this would provide a good estimate for the uh, for the uh, for the uh, uh, for mean right for the for the value mu. Now, for example, if you uh, if all x i s are Bernoulli, then we know that. Uh, uh, mu is of course, is a good estimate of mu in the sense this is also the probability p. If, if the probability of success is p, then uh, for uh, the expected value of each Bernoulli random variable is also equal to p the probability of success. And so, uh, what it is saying is that uh, when you take n large enough, then this would give you a good estimate of the probability of success. So, uh, these, pro, uh, these uh, law of this law of large number provides a uh, way of estimating uh, the mean of the distribution. This is the whole idea. Well, so, formally if you want to uh, define this concept that you know, then we will say that uh, given uh, delta and epsilon greater than 0 some arbitrary numbers, then uh, there exists a number m which is a function of epsilon and delta such that when you write this probability x 1 plus x 2 plus x n upon n which is x n bar, x n bar minus mu in absolute value greater than delta um, will be this probability will be less than epsilon for all n greater than or equal to the number dependent on epsilon and delta. 
So, this is simply you know just extending the notion of uh, or uh, just uh, the same no notion that you have about continuity. When you talk of continuous functions, then you want to say that the um, function values this and this for example, can be brought, brought as close as you wish. So, this greater than delta will be less than epsilon uh, provided um, for of for n big enough that means, n must be greater than or equal to um, some function, uh, uh, which is function of uh, a number, which is dependent on, which is a function of epsilon and delta. So, the whole idea is that, uh, as long as n is large enough, given the delta and epsilon, uh, you will be able to say the show, say that this probability greater than delta is less than epsilon. So, that means, when I choose delta and epsilon small, then this is essentially saying that, uh, for um, uh, you know uh, the the number x n bar comes close and flows to mu and uh, so this greater than delta whatever the, i mean uh, so the event will become impossible because if i choose epsilon very small then this probability is very small so of this difference being greater than delta so in probability so the whole thing is being talked about in terms of probability so uh, the proof is simple and here you see i will use chebyshev's inequality so by chebyshev's inequality uh, this says that so here as we have seen already that uh, you know for x n bar your variance because they are identically independently distributed will be sigma square by n right and the variance and the expected value of x n bar is mu so therefore uh, this is x n bar minus its expected value. So, this difference in absolute value greater than delta would be less than or equal to sigma square upon n delta square. Yeah. So, now here um, I did say that epsilon and delta are arbitrary, but see I can choose my epsilon to be sigma square upon n delta square. So, in a way epsilon is a function of delta that is ok. So, then this is I um, will choose my epsilon to be sigma square upon n delta square right and then that will give me that my n must be. So, that means, this number if I denote by epsilon, then this probability is less than or equal to epsilon for n. So, from here you see um, n the smallest value of n would be uh, sigma square of epsilon delta square, um, but uh, for all n greater than this number this uh, inequality will be satisfied. And so, my number capital M epsilon delta can be chosen like this. right? So, uh, so once we get that n is uh, greater than or equal to sigma square by uh, upon epsilon delta square, I mean this inequality is valid. So, what we have shown is that given epsilon and delta greater than 0, we can find an n such that this inequality is satisfied for all values of n greater than or equal to sigma square by epsilon delta square. So, this is our m of epsilon delta in the definition for um, you know um, um, uh, probability limit of the probability when we define uh, what we mean by uh, limit in se probability sense. So, then uh, uh, this is our uh, m, m of epsilon delta right. So, for all n greater than or equal to this given an epsilon and delta, uh, then for all um, n greater than or equal to this number, uh, this inequality will be satisfied right. And therefore, it follows immediately that um, uh, this limit of uh, probability of x n bar minus mu in absolute value uh, goes to 0 as n goes to infinity, because I as I as n becomes larger and larger I can choose for uh, I can choose epsilon smaller and smaller uh, here. Uh, oh, okay. uh, this was my uh, this is greater than or equal to uh, delta here I have chosen yes. And so, uh, hmm. so uh, in in my definition for uh, when I defined uh, the limit of a probability, then uh, we chose uh, this the epsilon. We chose a sigma square upon n delta square. So what we are saying is that this probability that is x n bar minus mu in absolute value greater than or equal to delta is less than or equal to epsilon. So when I want, so if I choose this equal to epsilon, then I am saying, and therefore as um, uh, epsilon becomes smaller and smaller, I can my n will become larger and larger, and so uh, uh, my from my definition of uh, limit in terms of probability, uh, in, it follows that this probability will tend to zero as n goes to infinity. Okay.
So, this is what we, uh, yeah. So, therefore, you see again here that I have made a very good use of uh, Chebyshev's inequality to show you that this probability, the limiting value of this probability of absolute value of x n bar minus mu will tend to 0 as n goes to infinity. That this satisfies the, so by Chebyshev's inequality, uh, this will be satisfied and so uh, x n, we have shown that uh, x n bar will converge to mu in probability. So, essentially uh, we, this is what, so when you take the limit as n goes to infinity, then you see this number goes to 0, because as n goes to infinity, epsilon converts uh, tends to 0. And so, therefore, um, uh, this pr uh, pr uh, limit in probability of uh, limit of the probability x n bar minus mu will go to 0 as n goes to infinity. So, essentially um, now uh, of course, uh, there can be uh, different interpretations and so one of the students interpreted this as uh, you know like if somebody who is uh, who is practicing to be uh, uh, let us say a swimmer. Uh, and uh, uh, so, what he will say is that uh, you mean that means, no matter how hard I practice uh, my uh, average performance will remain the same, because <laughs> in probability uh, x n bar is converging to mu. So, that means, he says that there is no scope for improvement, but again the fallacy in his argument is that um, see here we are, we are th this result we are proving under the assumption that x 1, x 2, x n the sequence is independently identically distributed. So, the identity part is not uh, uh, is not valid when you are practicing obviously, your these things are improving. Uh, so, your performance is improving every day and therefore, uh, to say that uh, you will never rise above the average that means, your average performance will remain the same no matter how hard you work is not correct, right. Because your x i s themselves are changing, they are no longer uh, identical, identically distributed. So, therefore, this is not a uh, good, uh, 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 this is not a good way to interpret the weak law of large numbers, but it certainly gives you a tool for estimating the value of uh, the mean of the uh, distribution from which uh, the random variables are coming. Right. So, um, we can now look at these examples uh, to see the uh, application of the weak law of large numbers. So, in fact, for example, if uh, your sequence is from um, uh, exponential 1 by lambda that means, they are all identically independently distributed random variables. That means, samples you are taking from an exponential distribution with, uh, with uh, parameter 1 by lambda. That is, the, um, the um, uh, p d f is 1 by lambda e raise to minus 1 by lambda x for all x positive. Then, um, this probability if you take x n bar here, x n bar minus lambda in absolute value greater than delta would be less than or equal to again by Chebyshev's inequality, because the. Uh, so, here uh, expected x i is mu uh, is lambda right, inverse of uh, the uh, parameter here and uh, variance x i is lambda square. Right, for exponential distribution. So, therefore, uh, this would be less than or equal to lambda square upon. So, for uh, the variance of x n bar would be therefore, lambda square by n. So, lambda square by n 1 upon delta square and this goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Right. So, uh, we can in fact, we can choose f for any delta, we can choose epsilon as I showed you here and it will satisfy this the definition. Anyway, so therefore, uh, what we are saying is that x n bar would be a good estimate for large n of n would be a good estimate for lambda for the mean of the distribution. Now, similarly, if you have a Poisson, uh, and if, if this uh, family, if the sequence is coming from a Poisson uh, distribution with uh, rate as lambda, then uh, again uh, this will be, uh, yeah. So, here uh, you have x i is lambda and variance also is the same for a Poisson. So, this is also lambda and so for variance of x n bar would be uh, lambda by n and so this probability greater than delta would be less than or equal to lambda upon l n delta square and this will again go to 0, because lambda and delta are finite as we said that you know we are talking about the situation where the mean and the variance are finite. So, this will again go to 0 as n goes to infinity. Right. 
And uh, similarly, uh, if you take this sample from. So, I am just giving you a few examples, but you will see that this is universally true, because there we did not specify, we simply said they should be independent identically distributed random variables. So, I uh, you three examples here, and if, if the sequence is from a normal uh, mu sigma square, uh, these are the sample values, then again uh, this will be less than or equal to. So, now here again your E x i is mu and variance x i of course, is given to be sigma square. So, variance x n bar would be sigma square by n, this will also go to 0 as n goes to infinity. So, uh, Chebyshev's inequality has proved to be a strong tool for proving weak convergence, right. And we will see that the other I showed you application of the Jensen's inequality also. And, um, uh, we will also again look at some more limit theorems, where also we will make use of these inequalities. Okay. So, therefore, um, the whole idea is that, um, I mean again one needs to emphasize the fact that um, we are not saying that the value um, that the x n bar will in, in, in value uh, tend to mu, what we are saying in probability it will tend to. So, therefore, uh, when we say it is a good estimate, this is in terms of probability, that the probability is very high of uh, this number becoming closer and closer to mu. So, uh, again as I said a uh, matter of interpretation, uh, you might say that you go to a casino and uh, you uh, go on put putting money in the uh, machine, slot machine and say uh, for a number of times you are not getting any, uh, you are not successful. So, uh, you will say that no, uh, it will soon happen, but that is not true, because again it is you know it is a, it's a matter of probability. Yes, the probability is high, uh, because uh, the uh, event is getting impossible. I mean this probability is getting to 0, that is fine, but it may happen that you may have to go on um, you know playing at the slot machine for a long, long time before you uh, your luck turns, right? or that means the things change. Uh, so, therefore, uh, one should not say that Yes, surely, uh, what we are saying here is that it will happen. That means, if you flip a coin and uh, you keep getting tails, then surely after some time you will get heads also, but uh, it does not say when, right. And it is a matter of, so uh, the, uh, the important thing to understand is that we are talking in terms of uh, convergence in probability. Okay. And so, this, uh, this uh, gives you a good way of estimating uh, the uh, mean of the distribution. That means, you take go on taking large enough samples, and then you take the average, and that will uh, give you an idea of uh, what your mean of the distribution is. Okay. So, uh, we will continue the discussion with the central limit theorem, and what we are saying is, so uh, here I want to you know uh, address the questions. For example, what does the distribution of x n bar look like? This is one question we want to answer, and we will use the central limit theorem to do that. And then the second question would be, how fast does x n bar converge to mu. Okay. And uh, so, now let us look at the, the central limit theorem states that sigma x i minus n mu upon under root n sigma will converge to n 0, com, no, that means normal standard normal uh, distribution as n goes to infinity. That means, this variate will, uh, because this is a random variable for all n. So, this uh, will converge to uh, the standard normal variate as n goes to infinity. Now, here because you see sigma expected value of sigma x i, i varying from 1 to n will be n mu and variance of sigma x i, i varying from 1 to n will be n sigma square the x i's are sequence of independently identically distributed random variables. So, this is and therefore, you are standardizing by subtracting the mean of this variate. So, minus n mu divided by the standard deviation, which is root n sigma. So, therefore, this um, we are saying that after uh, standardizing the variate sigma x i, i varying from 1 to n, the central limit theorem says that this will go to uh, n 0 1. Okay. Uh, in, so, in distribution. Right. And uh, the weak law of large numbers said that uh, uh, in probability sigma x i that is sigma x i by n 
uh, will converge to mu in probability. But what we are going to say here show this to answer the first question that is if you now divide by n then this becomes sigma x i i varying from 1 to n divided by n and uh, there will be an n here and there is a root n. So, that becomes root n times divided by sigma right. So, this whole thing and we are saying that this was so therefore, now this is um, yeah. Okay. And therefore, the central limit theorem says that this converges to this variate will converge to uh, the normal 0 1. So, I can write down sigma upon root n here and so essentially what we are saying is that x n will converge that means, uh, the distribution of x n bar uh, you know as limiting distribution of x n bar will be. Uh, so, right now the distribution of x n bar uh, for large n we are saying will be close to mu uh, normal mean mu and sigma and variance sigma square by n. And then of course, as n goes to infinity we are saying that. So, in other words that uh, the central limit theorem says that if you take any distribution uh, your x 1, x 2, x n were coming from uh, any uh, distribution, but then when you talk of x n bar and for large enough n then you see uh, the, uh, the curve will become bell shaped. It will get closer and closer to the normal curve for large n and the limiting value uh, this will converge to a uh, variate which has the normal standard normal distribution. And so, uh, uh, C L T the central limit theorem uh, implies the weak law of large numbers, because weak law of large numbers only said in probability x n bar will converge to mu the probability of mod x n minus x n bar minus mu uh, will converge to uh, 0. And, uh, so, but here it is saying that in distribution. So, x n bar in distribution will converge to uh, standard normal. Uh, well, okay, sorry, I should not say because if I am taking x n bar, uh, if I am simply taking x n bar, then this will converge to n mu of. Uh, so, well, okay, um, I have simply said it here for x n bar. I have not talked of the limiting value. What we are saying is that this will. This will be approximated by normal mu comma sigma square by n. So the proper statement is that x n bar, the distribution of x n bar for large enough n will look like a normal mu comma sigma square by n. But you can see that as n goes to infinity, uh, this thing will become so the whole mass will get concentrated on mu only for x n bar. So but then if you look at x n bar minus mu x n bar minus mu this absolute value. Then uh, we are saying that the uh, uh, or okay, if you are looking at x n bar minus mu upon sigma by n uh, sigma uh, this is yeah sigma by root n. Then this thing we uh, see uh, this will converge to uh, so, that means, this can be approximated by standard normal, but when you look at x n bar then this will be uh, you know approximately normal mu comma sigma square by n. So, the final theorem we can now state as, so if you have x 1, x 2, x n and so on uh, sequence of identically independently uh, distributed random variables, each x i the having a mean mu and variance sigma square and this variance is finite. So, if the variance is finite that means, the variance exists then the means will exist. So, we do not have to separately say that uh, mu is also finite and uh, variance is also finite. It is enough if you say that uh, the variance is finite then it implies that uh, the mean also exists. Then the distribution of distribution of see this is important of x 1 plus x 2 plus x n minus n mu upon root n sigma. This converges to the standard normal distribution 0 1 as n goes to infinity. Right. This is what that is. Um, in other words, if we want to say the same thing is that uh, the probability that x 1 plus x 2 plus x n minus n mu upon root n sigma is less than or equal to a. This will converge to the uh, form that 1 upon root 2 pi integral minus infinity to a e raise to minus 1 by 2 x square d x for all a belonging to r. Because this is your um, p, uh, this is the cumulative distribution function for, uh, so this is the, what you are saying is this is probability z less than or equal to a. 
Yeah, so which I have written down here, that is if you define your uh, uh, random variable y n as sigma i varying from 1 to n of x i minus n mu upon root n sigma, then uh, the uh, cumulative distribution function of y n uh, as n goes to infinity will converge to the cumulative uh, distribution function of the standard normal variate z, right, and this is for all a. And this is what remember earlier I had defined uh, convergence in distribution or in law, which said that the cumulative distribution function of a random sequence of random variables converges to a particular um, uh, per, uh, uh, cumulative distribution function. Then we say that the sequence of random variables converges to that particular uh, random variable in law or in distribution. And so, here this is what we are saying that your sequence of random variables y n as n goes to 1, 2, 3 up to infinity, then this uh, sequence of random variables converges to uh, the standard normal variate in law. So, now uh, we have had a uh, look at the central limit theorem in various forms, its implications and of course, we will continue looking at its applications more and more. Mm -hmm.